Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's International Space Station Research and Technology News Briefing. We thought this would be a great opportunity as we prepare for the launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis to fill you in on how things are going up in space, 220 miles above where the International Space Station has been cruising for the last 10 years doing meaningful science. We have a panel of experts today to uh, give us an update, and I'd like to introduce them now. And after that, we'll uh, have opening comments from them and then take questions from the reporters. Uh, adjacent to me right here is uh, Dr. Julie Robinson, International Space Station Program Scientist. To her left is Dr. Cheryl Nickerson, professor with the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University. To her left, Dr. Eduardo Almeida, research scientist at the Ames Research Center. And to his left, Dr. Imara Pereira, research associate professor, the Department of Plant Biology at North Carolina State University. So welcome, and uh, we'll begin with some comments from Dr. Julie Robinson. Julie? Thanks, Michael. So we're really excited to be here with you today and talk to you about just a few of the experiments that are going to be enabled by this last space shuttle flight. Of course, the space shuttle was important for us at NASA because we needed its, its really large carrying capacity to assemble the vehicle of the space station, to assemble a laboratory that is essentially the size of a four-bedroom house. And we've brought today to you some of the scientists who are using this laboratory in their research and whose research will be flying on the space shuttle. In any six-month period, we have about 200 investigations that are active on the space station now that its assembly has been completed in 2011. And about half of those are U.S. scientists. There are dozens of experiments that go up and return on any given flight, whether that's a space shuttle flight or an ATV, automated transfer vehicle, European flight, or an HTV, Japanese uh, transfer vehicle flight. And so that keeps our space station resupplied, keeps our scientists' work active. Today we'll be sharing some samplings of biotechnology investigations that are going on. Some of these are through ISS as a national laboratory where any scientist in the country can use the space station as a laboratory for their research. Others are sponsored by NASA because NASA has an interest in the exploration potential of the research. And after you see this science briefing, you'll have the opportunity both here at the Kennedy Space Center Press Center as well as on NASA TV to see some demonstrations of technology development that will also be doing based on hardware flying on this flight, especially the robotic refueling mission, which is a collaboration of NASA and the Canadian Space Agency to test refueling technologies in orbit. So with that as a sampling of the dozens and dozens of investigations enabled by the shuttle flight, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Nickerson to tell you about her new partnership with NASA. So good afternoon. Um, it's an honor to have the opportunity to talk to you today about our STS-135 flight experiment that's operationally called RASIV and uh, the potential for this work to lead to better vaccine development to prevent infectious diseases back here for the general public on Earth. A RASIV stands for Recombinant Attenuated Salmonella Vaccine. And, and I know that sounds like a, a bit of a complicated title, but it's really just the next phase in our infectious disease research that is fundamentally advancing and moving forward are the results from our previous spaceflight experiments. Our collaborative RASIV teams come from three different laboratories. Two of those laboratories are at the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University, those being my laboratory and the laboratory of Dr. Roy Curtis III, and then at the NASA Johnson Space Center, the laboratory of Dr. Mark Ott. Collectively, our RASIV team has years of experience and expertise in studying the responses and infectious disease potential of microbial pathogens to spaceflight and also in the clinical design and uh, uh, in the engineering and clinical design and testing of a RAS of vaccine strains as immunizing vectors to protect against infectious disease here for the general public on Earth. Having said that, uh, it's important to mention that in our spaceflight experiment, we're not trying to blindly develop uh, a new vaccine strain. Rather, we are focused on improving a vaccine strain that currently exists here on Earth. It's in human clinical trials. And and while this RASA vaccine strain is showing exciting promise, it needs to be improved in terms of enhancing its protective immunogenicity uh, to confer better protection against infectious disease. So 
I often get asked the story or the question, why do infectious disease research in spaceflight? What is the value of that? Well, there's tremendous potential in using the spaceflight platform for this because first of all, we know every time uh, that we force biological systems to survive and respond and adapt to extreme environments, we have learned tremendous new insight in terms of about how they function, about how they live, about how they exist. And we've been able to take that new insight and translate it to new therapies therapies, uh, new products, new strategies that we use on a daily basis here on Earth to improve our quality of life. So it shouldn't be surprising then that spaceflight is just the next logical extreme environment to use that's been relatively untapped, but which holds tremendous potential to provide novel insight into cellular response mechanisms, especially for the infectious disease world. And it's also important to note that spaceflight produces a fluidic environment that's very similar to environments in our body that microbial pathogens encounter when they infect us. So the take home message is, um, and I think we should be on the second slide by now, my apologies for not having that slide advanced. <laughs> the take home message is cells grown in microgravity exhibit novel biomedically relevant responses that they do not or we cannot observe when we grow those cells here on Earth. That's because ma gravity masks a lot of those effects. So it is for these very exact reasons to find these novel insights into human health and disease and cellular the response mechanisms that we have paired and joined with NASA in a Space Act agreement to use the International Space Station for research to translationally advance human health. So on the third slide, if you take a look at that, um, you will see uh, a little overview of, of our previous and now our current uh, spaceflight uh, uh, work. And our previous spaceflight work has provided novel insight into the, how the major human pathogen Salmonella causes disease in the body. And we discovered that spaceflight increases the disease causing potential, what we call virulence, of this pathogen. But interestingly, when we looked at the genes that were switched on and off in spaceflight uh, that Salmonella um, that were important for its virulence, they were switched on and off in a very different way than how they're regulated, those same genes are regulated when we study the virulence of that organism here on Earth. That's very important because understanding how virulence genes are switched on and off is critical for designing new strategies to prevent infection and disease such as vaccines. So with the knowledge that the spaceflight environment uniquely turns on or switches on and off genes that are important for the disease causing ability of this pathogen, those genes serve or lend themselves as novel targets for vaccine development. We're going to apply a very similar approach now to a salmonella vaccine strain. And I'm going to tell you about that vaccine strain we're going to uh, fly. This particular salmonella vaccine strain has been genetically engineered so that it does not cause disease in humans but it has had inserted into it or it carries a special antigenic protein that is protective against disease caused by streptococcus pneumonia or pneumococcus. So this addition of this antigenic protein stimulates a protective immune response in the body without actually causing disease. We chose pneumococcus as our disease to study because this is a globally devastating disease. It kills 10 million people annually, but particularly vulnerable are the newborns, very young children, and elderly people whose uh, immune responses are, are less able to be better protected by the current pneumococcal vaccines that exist. They are just not protected as well at all. So our hope is that we can use the spaceflight platform um, to, to help engineer the RASF strain back here on Earth to enhance its protective immunogenicity capabilities and make it a vac better vaccine strain. So for our experiment, our RASF vaccine strain is going to go up in these specially designed canisters. And once on orbit, the crew will activate our experiment in these canisters. These same canisters will be loaded and used by my team on the ground at the Kennedy Space Center under identical conditions, except it doesn't fly, with the same vaccine strain. After return from Earth, the RASA vaccine strain will be compared to the synchronous ground control vaccine strain for its ability to protect against 
disease caused by pneumococcus, and also to globally look at how the gene expression patterns have changed between the flight prone and the ground control strain. And because RASIVs are protective against a wide variety of different human and animal pathogens, um, the outcome of this experiment could really hold exciting promise to lead to new treatments for diseases other than just pneumococcus. And that is indeed what we hope that our Space Act, uh, a space Act agreement will provide to us at ASU, is the potential to continually and routinely have access to the ISS National Laboratory platform to advance this work. Dr. Almeida? Yes, it's a pleasure to speak to you today. I'm going to talk about the experiment that we're conducting uh, using uh, stem cells to assess what the effects of microgravity are uh, on stem cell health. So one of the most profound findings uh, that we have made about the nature of space is that when you take gravity away from a biological organism, all kinds of changes uh, happen. And we've collected a lot of physiology information over the years about these. We know about bone loss, immune dysfunction, perhaps problems with wound healing, uh, and the problems go on and on and on. Recently, what we have discovered is that perhaps a lot of these problems that we observe, uh, physiological changes that we observe in space, have one thing in common. And it's that perhaps stem cells that are required to regenerate, for instance, bone, muscle, the immune system, and for instance, participating in wound healing, perhaps those stem cells are not functioning properly under conditions of microgravity. And so that realization is what has motivated us to study uh, precisely the effects of microgravity uh, on stem cells. And so stem cell health is incredibly important because throughout your life, all your body is being constantly renewed and regenerated by adult stem cells. So we all know intuitively that uh, mechanical loading, physical exercise is good for you. And so that reflects uh, itself in bigger muscles, stronger bones, stronger immune system, even better memory. And so for each one of these things that uh, mechanical loading of the body does on Earth, we think that there may be a deficit in space. And so we're precisely focusing on that problem of stem cell health in the body and how it might be affected by microgravity. So we've already done one of these experiments on STS-131 with uh, mouse embryonic stem cells as a model, and what we did was to differentiate those cells into adult-like tissues. So we took the stem cells, which are immortal, and changed the culture conditions so that they differentiated into uh, cells that are, were, for instance, in beating cardiomyocytes, uh, epithelial cells, and neural cells, and so on. And so we looked at gene expression patterns, we look at their function, and what we've realized is that in space, that process of changing from a stem cell into an adult tissue is greatly impaired. So the cells maintain their stemness. They keep markers of stem cells, and they fail to move on to differentiated tissue status. So in this flight on STS-135, we're going to follow up on those results, and we are specifically differentiating mouse embryonic stem cells into keratinocytes, and we're interested in the specific problem of the participation of these epidermal cells in wound healing. This is one of the things that has been noted in spaceflight. There is some evidence that wound healing may not be functioning normally. And we think that one of the reasons this might be happening is because the stem cells that exist, adult stem cells that exist in the epidermis, may not be progressing normally from that state of stem cell to a differentiated functional tissue. So that's uh, the idea behind the experiment, so how we're going to do it. Um, I didn't bring the whole uh, set of hardware, but I brought one bioreactor, which you can see here. This system um, is a chamber <coughs> with hollow fibers that pass through nutrients, and the cells will be here, and it's almost like a dialysis machine. When the nutrient medium goes through the fibers, it exchanges uh, nutrients and removes uh, waste products from the cell culture, and so in this way, uh, using the CCM, the cell culture 
uh, module hardware. We can culture cells for several weeks uh, without human intervention, fully automated. At the end, we will analyze both live cells that come back to Earth as well as cells that will be fixed during the flight so that we have a snapshot in microgravity of what the gene expression patterns are of these cells. So hopefully what we learn from these studies is whether or not stem cell health and tissue regeneration is going to be a problem for long-term uh, space flight. You know, right now we are seeing a lot of these regenerative problems emerge with short terms of space flight. But if we are going to travel to far planets, and if we are going to have a, a continued presence in space, we need to understand this. And this is also a unique way of understanding problems on Earth, because, you know, it's only when you lose gravity that we get to really appreciate how important that mechanical stimulation of the body is for health. So in a way, the environment on the shuttle, on the ISS, is really a unique laboratory for understanding uh, this uh, per uh, pervasive factor that we cannot get away from on Earth. Dr. Pereira? Uh, yes, hello. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to tell you about something that's a little bit different but is also very important for human health. Um, our experiment is focused on plants. And as you know, on Earth, plants are very important as a source of food and also to clean the air and the water. And if you think about any long distance space mission in the future, it's going to be important. Uh, plants will be a vital component of regenerable life support. So we need to understand how plants grow in the microgravity environment. And right now, um, space or microgravity is not the optimal environment for plant growth. So our experiment is focused on trying to understand uh, the molecular responses of plants to microgravity in order to be able to better engineer plants uh, for future space flight. Uh, and if I can have, oh yes. Um, so our patch kind of um, expresses this. Um, you can see our little model organism, Arabidopsis, which is kind of like the E.coli for plant um, genetic studies. Uh, it's ideal for these studies because it's really small and it grows fast and there's a lot of genetic information out there and molecular tools for Arabidopsis. Uh, you can see the DNA um, strand at the bottom that's to represent that we're going to do gene expression studies and look at transcript profiles um, of plants grown in microgravity. and um, uh, the other thing that's important is you can see that this is a collaborative effort. We are very grateful to NASA and ESA and Ames Research for um, helping us with this project. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, as you can see here, the big picture shows you an experimental container. And above that is a little seed cassette. Uh, the seed cassettes were designed by Ames Research, and I have one here too you can see. Um, the seeds will be mounted in the seed cassette. Um, they're stable in this condition and they will be uh, carried on STS-135 to the International Space Station. Once we get to the International Space Station, these uh, experimental containers, which are the containers at the bottom of the screen, those will be loaded onto a special um, chamber called the EMCS, or European Modular Cultivation System. This is a unique experimental system for us because it's an environmentally contained chamber, and the nice thing about it is that it actually has two centrifuges on it, so we can do our 1G control in the same space environment. So what that means is one rotor will be spinning to simulate 1G, or Earth's gravity, and the other one will remain stationary, and that will be micro-G. So other than the difference in G, all the other conditions within the EMCS will be the same. So we have a nice um, controlled experiment. Um, we also, from previous work, have um, um, determined 
or are interested in a particular signaling pathway that's operational in plants. And so we actually have two different types of plants that we'll be comparing in this experiment, control plants and plants that have been genetically modified to have their signaling uh, components uh, compromised. And so using this information, comparing these two types of plants, we hope that we'll be able to get a snapshot of what's going on at a molecular level and compare these experiments, uh, compare these plants so that we can better engineer them for future space experiments. Um, in addition to that, this work has application to ground um, or to Earth as well, because um, the space environment, as I said, is very stressful. And um, this will give us some information about extreme environments on ground as well. Uh, for the final slide, this will just show you, these are the kinds of data that will be collected while the experiment is running. So once the seed cassettes, once the experiment starts, the seed cassettes will be hydrated. And we will get two sets of images every six hours. We have what we call the overview image, which will show you every single seed cassette and the little seedlings growing. And then we'll also get close-up images that you can see um, in the blow-up. And uh, this experiment will run for five days. At the end of that, the samples will be preserved on the ISS, uh, frozen on the ISS, and then returned to us at a later date so we can carry out our molecular analysis. Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, please wait for the microphone, state your name and affiliation, and to whom you're addressing your question. And we'll start off with Seth Bornstein. Uh, <coughs> yes, excuse me. Seth Bornstein, AP, for Dr. Nickerson. Um, the uh, vaccine, you said it was, it, it's salmonella and it's got the added pneumococcus, uh, streptogenic pneumococcus, but you're only looking at the pneumococcus, uh, effects on the pneumococcus. Uh, why aren't you looking in specifically at the uh, effects of the other, um, you know, the other protective uh, for other diseases there? And have there been other vaccines? What's been the result of other vaccines that have been flown in microgravity? Some excellent questions. I'll answer the second one first and the first one second. To my knowledge, no other vaccines have been flown in microgravity. This is the first experiment to actually fly a vaccine that's in human clinical trials that just needs to be improved. Okay, other approaches are trying to develop vaccines in spaceflight. We're just taking a different approach. We're flying a vaccine that exists and needs to be made better. Um, the other question in terms of, yes, we are looking to improve the uh, anti-pneumococcal protective immunity for this vaccine. Um, it's already protective against salmonella <laughs> because it carries salmonella as a crippled vector. So that's the easy part. The hard part is to get salmonella to, um, to protectively, uh, robustly elicit a protective immune response that is done without a needle. Okay, which is a major advantage over other vaccines, and can confer uh, as close to 100% immunity as possible. An advantage of using uh, Salmonella to do this is it elicits uh, one of the three arms of the immune response that you miss when you go by a needle, and that's um, called the mucosal immune response because this vaccine will be given orally, and so uh, because you're working with a crippled version of salmonella, if you will. Of course, we can't give a, a version of that strain that would cause disease. So kind of view it as we've, it's been genetically engineered to have one arm tied behind its back. So it can go in and punch, it's got to punch, but it can't punch enough to cause disease. And that's a very, very thin line that you're walking. Because if you attenuate or reduce that ability to punch too much, it won't elicit a good immune response. If you don't, if you don't attenuate enough, it's going to cause disease. And it, it, we're fortunate that our investigators have had uh, decades of experience in, in engineering this particular vaccine strain. We just need to make it a little better. Okay, so I just want to make sure I'm clear. So you, as far as the, uh, the, the salmonella, it's all right. That's not, that part is not the tinker. It's the, just the pneumococcus part that you're trying to improve. And I'm trying, in terms of efficacy, what is it now? Um, so you know you're going to, yeah. What kind of uh, virulent, you know, what what kind of effectiveness or however you measure it, what is it now with what, what you've got, and what is your goal to try to get to? The the goal is to get to a single oral dose that requires no boosters that confers 100% protection, long term. 
That's always the goal of any vaccine. Having said that, current anti-pneumococcal vaccines are either subunit vaccines um, that are composed of just capsular, the outer covering of streptococcus pneumonia, is, or, and or they have uh, a protein attached to them to make them more immunogenic. Unfortunately, those particular vaccines, um, and they're administered by a needle, in the newborn and elderly population, they're only about 60 percent effective. And so uh, the goal for the current vaccine is by taking it orally and having salmonella there to stimulate a strong protective mucosal immunity, we anticipate that we're going to get protection against salmonella. That's already been shown. We now want to use salmonella as this vector to provide protection against, against other um, pathogens, including um, uh, in addition to streptococcus pneumonia. And uh, the first uh, data has just come back from the clinical trials uh, from this work. And again, it is showing exciting promise. Uh, I don't want to release numbers because we need to go back with our, our team and look at those. It's showing exciting promise, no negative side effects. Okay, but it's showing excited ability to protect, but it, we need to make that protection better so it can do it with one dose. I guess just to follow up. From the, yeah, I know you don't want to give numbers from the clinical trial, but there's still a gap between what you're seeing on the ground clinical trial and 100% otherwise. I guess my point is, are you, if, if it's really good right now on the ground, why bother doing this? You're correct. There's a gap. It needs to be better. It's not good enough yet, but we believe we can get it there. Right here in the front row. Hi, Emily Baldwin from Astronomy Now with a question for Dr. Robinson. Um, whenever I bring up the topic of uh, the International Space Station with people back home, whether it's the general public and also other members of the science community, I'm, also, I'm often sort of met with a lot of cynicism with people saying it's a very expensive science laboratory and we don't actually see that much from it. Now, we've heard some fantastic examples of experiments already. I was wondering if you had a, a message for those people, perhaps sort of commenting on how the International Space Station, you know, what it, what it can do for you, basically. Well, so you have to put those kinds of perspectives in a historical context because uh, 15 years ago, scientists, there were some scientists who said, well, I only think I'd do a couple of experiments there and that isn't that important to me. They were imagining, should we build the space station or not? In the U.S., we made the decision that assembling the space station was important to us for a number of reasons. For our space technology development for building peaceful partnerships in space. And the assembly of the space station has achieved those two objectives beautifully. Now we're shifting from the decade of assembly to the decade of research. And during that decade of research is when the scientists will get the chance to do all of those experiments that have been envisioned. You're seeing some of the life scientists, the biologists, and the different creative things that they're doing. But we also have the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which uh, has been on orbit for a little less than a couple months now, and already got its billionth observation of galactic cosmic rays. That's addressing a completely different community, the community of fundamental physicists. We have human physiologists, we have uh, fluid physicists, and we have a variety of technologies. So that breadth of application, now that the laboratory's built, it's really time, and in fact, uh, Nature Magazine uh, said this in a, in a recent editorial about four months ago. They said, now it's time for scientists to put their best experiments forward and use the laboratory. Thanks. I'm Carrie Sheridan from Agency France Press. Um, for Dr. Almeida, could you describe, um, you mentioned that there's been some knowledge that wound healing doesn't happen very well in space. Can you give us a few examples of how that's been learned? And if stem cells aren't acting properly in space, um, how are we going to overcome that hurdle? Is it something that could potentially prevent humans from spending long, t long time, longer periods in space? Well. A lot of the, <coughs> the physiology data for wound healing is anecdotal uh, from astronauts that have that experience, and uh, it's not a controlled study. Uh, it's just medical data collected over the years. Um, so, you know, on the ground we would uh, use an animal model, a mouse, for instance. We would do a study. We would compare the factors uh, objectively. Um, we do have a lot of anecdotal evidence uh, from medical records that this is a problem. And so we're following up on that kind of hint that there is a problem there and trying to determine if the, one of the key components of wound healing, in this case uh, the keratinocyte, uh, is able to differentiate normally in space. And we already have a lot of evidence uh, that, uh, that it's not. So um, 
th that that's what we're working with. You know, space. Uh, you know, it takes ten years to do in space what you could do in the laboratory in less than six months. So we have to be patient, uh, and we have to go on hints for a lot of things. But this is something that we are we seeing it as a as a unifying uh, theme. Uh, the fact that stem cells in general uh, may not be progressing normally to regenerate tissues in the body. And so uh, what could we do uh, to improve this? Well, the obvious uh, answer is to restore mechanical stimulation of the body. And this would be done with artificial gravity, with a centrifuge of sorts that would uh, impart, uh, again, you know, the mechanical pressure from, uh, from hydrostatic gravity, generating hydrostatic pressure, the, the heart pumping more strongly, all that creates a mechanical environment in the body that is necessary to stimulate cell growth. And we actually know a lot about how this happens. We know that uh, this growth-promoting signaling in cells is the result of uh, signaling from interactions between uh, integrants, uh, the extracellular matrix, things like collagen, through uh, kinase cascades that promote cell cycle progression. And on the ground, we can put cells on a centrifuge, let's say at 10G versus 1G, um, and we, at the end of a day or two, we find that 150% uh, increase in cell proliferation, just as a response to increased gravity. So we know that we, we can promote cell growth, and this proliferative uh, part of regeneration of tissues simply by restoring uh, gravity. Now, from a technical point of view, engineering a centrifuge and the cost of it, it's fairly expensive, and for short stays in space, the benefit uh, balance with cost has been such that we take the risk of not having that mechanical stimulation. But from what we're learning, it may very well be that long-term space travel may require restoring some sort of uh, artificial gravity. Gentleman in the rear. Doug Mone, um TMC Satellite Spotlight. Um, can the three of you address um, how long your experiments need to um, go on in space before you see a result? Is there a magic number, for instance, where you, you want to have a virus, you want to have um, the bacteria up there for two weeks, two days, sub, you know, is there, is there any way to quantify that? There seems to be like some sort of magic number that's being, well, not magic number, but, but you know, it, it seems like the longer exposure is good, shorter exposure bad when it comes to seeing these results. Um, it's a good question. It depends on what is the question you're asking. Um, for example, our experiment will be activated to grow uh, for only three days. Um, because we're interested in more of the short-term effects for the study and also because our hardware is not designed to allow these cells to grow for longer periods of time. If you're more interested in looking at, which is just as important, the long-term effects of culturing cells in the microgravity environment, that is addressing a different question than what we need to answer for our immediate efforts for this for this pneumococcal vaccine. Both of those questions are important to understand the effects of microgravity during long-term or short-term culture growth. Um, I strongly suspect, and I would like to hear the, what my colleagues think, that you're going to get much different responses long-term than, than you would short-term as the cells begin to adapt and change and um, uh, learn to live in that environment. Uh, our previous experiments were done short-term wherein we showed salmonella became a much better pathogen in flight. And, and it uniquely changed the expression of these genes which are important for causing disease differently than what we see on Earth. That's what gave us the impetus to move forward with this RASA vaccine strain to, to basically replicate those additions for a shorter term flight. Uh, again, it just depends on what your application is to whether you're going to go short or long. Okay, but follow up on that. You're not going to get the same results by doing a, a suborbital run for like five minutes. You're going to need a long, you need a minimum period of time. We need a generation time. For our particular experiment, we need to have multiple generations so the cells can adapt and grow and respond. Uh, so we definitely need something like a, a minute, a few minutes, whatever. We need a few days. So let me address your question, too. There are, it really depends on what you're doing scientifically. There are some experiments that you only need a few minutes. For instance, the interaction between two cells. 
like for instance an antibody presenting cell. Uh, that can be done in a very short period of exposure to microgravity. But in general, um, we have already done a lot of those experiments, um, and the scientific community now is more interested in the long term. So we've been doing for 50 years almost experiments uh, limited to low Earth orbit and to short periods of time up to two weeks. Well, we now want to know what happens with one month in space, with two months in space. And the limits that we have are the hardware. We cannot keep things alive for that long. We need to build better cell culture machines that will go for longer. We need to build better habitats for mice and other organisms that will let us do an experiment for many months. From my own point of uh, view from my research in stem cells, you know, you have a variety of speed of regeneration. If you look at the lining of the intestine, that has been regenerating extremely fast. In a few days, you have turnover of the whole lining. The same is true for blood. But other tissues are much, much, much slower in regenerating. So if you're looking at repair of a heart muscle, for instance, or in, for instance, formation of memory in the brain from, uh, uh, from neural stem cells, all those things are very long-term processes. So if you want to study those, you have to have animals uh, like small rodents in orbit for months uh, in order to be able to get good, uh, good data. So that's why the ISS is so important for us, because it will let us get to that set of experiments that we have not, never gotten to before. Yes, that's true for our experiment, too. Uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't say it's totally long term. It's probably sort of intermediate because we're not going for a whole life cycle, but we are germinating the seed and growing them for about five to six days. Uh, again, we have a limitation with the hardware as to how long we can grow them, So, because these are really small seed cassettes. Uh, by about six days, they're going to get um, too big to be in this uh, confined space. Okay, uh, gentleman in the green shirt here. Gene McCulga for Talking Space. Um, this is for uh, Julie Robinson. Could you take us through the process of how an experiment is selected to fly on the International Space Station? Thanks. Sure. Um, one of the really interesting things about the space station as it exists today is it's really a model of the way that scientists in the United States do research on the ground as well. So there are a variety of different sources of funding. Uh, from NASA funding, National Institutes of Health funding, National Science Foundation. Um, there are corporations that fund research on the space station as part of their R&D program. Um, and then there are, and those, all those different selection processes come into play. When a scientist like Dr. Nickerson comes forward, her early research was funded by NASA. Her later research now has, she's uh, raised that money privately because of the important application on Earth. And so there's not a single process for how research comes onto the space station, but if it's selected by NASA, it comes in through that NASA sponsoring organization at NASA headquarters. If it comes in some other way, such as Dr. Nickerson's work, then it comes in through a Space Act agreement through our National Laboratory Office. And and then both kinds of research come together in space. So it's really outstanding because it matches that same pattern of innovation that has made the United States such a, a great scientific power. And we have all of those opportunities open for great ideas to get to space. Okay, right here. Hi, I'm Catherine Qualtro with Kiwi Space Foundation and UNCC. Um, I have uh, two questions. Um, first for Dr. Almeida. Uh, you talked about how stem cells don't function properly under microgravity. Um, specifically the failure of the stem cell to move into an adult differentiated form. I know that NASA has a long track record of using space science to help our health here on Earth. Are the effects of microgravity that you've seen, do they show any similarity to um, possible stem cell dysfunction and diseases on Earth, autoimmune diseases? Yes, absolutely. I think the best analogy is uh, physical inactivity with aging. Uh, so being uh, physically active is extremely important for health. And now we're starting to realize that that physical activity, that mechanical stimulation of the body, helps regenerate tissues. For instance, uh, there's a study uh, about memory in uh, elderly persons. And if you are physically active, that promotes, uh, you know, for instance, walking. That increases blood pressure while you're walking. And that blood pressure in the brain promotes the proliferation of, uh, of, uh, of neural stem cells that are necessary to form new memories. Um, the same is true, for instance, for bone health. You know, 
uh, if you uh, mechanically load your bones by walking or running, uh, the proliferation of osteoblasts is promoted as well as chondrocytes to form both mineralized bone as well as cartilage, and then you repair and rebuild bones as a result of that physical activity. So all these cells, they're adult stem cells. They're not, they're not in their f formal functional form. They're sitting there, they're still capable of dividing, and so they're adult stem cells, and their growth proliferation is stimulated by this mechanical stimulus. And I was telling uh, earlier about the, the mechanism involving how the cell attached to the, to the, in bone, for instance, to the collagen matrix promotes kinase signaling and then promotes entry into the cell cycle. So that whole process uh, is not, we're starting to understand it, and absolutely it has a great deal of relevance for health on Earth because it, it is a parallel to what's happening with physical inactivity, especially in aging. And if we are able to experimentally take out gravity, we really have a unique ability to study the problem and to come up with novel therapies and novel ways of uh, understanding and solving the problem. And just, just to add to what he said, um, we work on these processes at multiple different levels. So Dr. Almeida's work is working at the cellular level. We also have researchers that are looking at the organismal level, either using rodents as models, and then we have researchers using the astronauts as their subjects to understand the processes of bone loss that are going on. And, and so there's a real power to having this long-term laboratory where you can take the information from each level and put it into the follow-on investigation six months later or a year later to really move things forward. So I would add just one more thing to that. So we actually did some uh, NASA uh, uh, Russian Space Agency uh, collaborative studies with the um, Photon M2 and Photon M3 uh, flights uh, in 2005 and 7, and in that in those experiments we did animal studies in which we uh, surgically removed the tip of uh, the tail in the newt. And as you may know, uh, these amphibians have the ability to regenerate their tail, and so we studied in the whole animal uh, how well the tail regeneration could occur in space, and we found that there was a deficit. So that was the whole animal. So when I wrote the grant that supported the, this current work, that data was there, and so we had a basis for believing that in a whole organism, a regenerative process that depends on stem cells was uh, failing in space. And so we went on to, s to focus on the cellular mechanisms, and now we're going to the molecular mechanisms. So we started by looking at the whole biological process in the organism and, st and start to narrow it down to understand those molecular mechanisms that will let us come up with therapeutical interventions and understand what the process is. Seth. Seth Bornstein again and from AP. Uh, for Dr. Robinson, I know this might be a little unfair to ask and maybe premature, but since microgravity missions been flying for now 20 some years, you know, including shuttle, uh, I don't know how many times I've heard this, you know, this study and that study going up there and then you never really hear much about the results. Um, is there sort of a figure uh, percentage on obviously I know you there's figures on how many articles have been written in scientific journals but in terms of how often the research has paid off into a actual change in in understanding and or therapy uh, here on earth of something um, as opposed to finding a, a nil response you know finding that there was no difference here or that and how does that compare to earthbound studies? Right, so let me, let me address the question in two ways. Uh, first of all, you have to look at how limited, really, the scientific opportunity has been in human spaceflight to date. In a shuttle mission, you might have uh, several dozen investigators. They only had two weeks. They had one experiment. It was carefully choreographed. If anything went wrong, they might not have another opportunity to fly for five years. If anything went right, they also didn't have another opportunity to fly for five years. And so the, the rate of progress in the disciplines has been extraordinarily slow. During ISS assembly, 
once again, we had to get this shuttle assembled as rapidly as possible, or the space station assembled as rapidly as possible. And then in, in pr proceeding toward that goal, we did research on the side to try and, and optimize any little bit of extra crew time, any little bit of extra up mass. We, we did that for pathfinding investigations. If you add all of that research up to date, the, and you look at, at it just in terms of the crew as a laboratory technician, we have basically accomplished about 15 to 20 percent of the research that lies ahead of us on the space station in the next decade. So we've really hardly scratched the surface. Um, and that's a really important thing to understand because the way that scientists do their research is they do something in the laboratory, they see the result, they turn it around and they do it again. And what you're, we're starting to see on the space station now is that pattern of research is the way that things are working for investigators. We don't select somebody for a single flight opportunity anymore. We select them for a series of flight opportunities. We build in so that we're ready to do the next experiment that derives from the information they learn on their immediate experiment. And that's really transforming the ability to get results out of the platform. We could only do that when space station assembly was complete this year and when its primary purpose was, was then for the, for the research and, and technology testing. The other thing, the other way I want to address that question is in terms of the time it takes to get from a clinical research result or from a, from a uh, laboratory research result to a clinical research result. The National Institutes of Health calls this the valley of death because it can take a really long time for a scientific discovery to make its way across. When Dr. Nickerson was talking about her work, she mentioned that um, the, the vaccine that she's flying has been used in research for a decade already, and they're still working to improve it. And I may have, I may have misstated, so she may want to correct that. But um, we, most of our researchers we see working with strains incrementally, doing, making different kinds of incremental improvements. That shift to clinical trials doesn't happen the day after you return from flight. And so we have a number of ISS early research results that are at the clinical trial stage, either with um, investigational new drugs approved or with investigational new drugs at the interim testing stage before they go to clinical trials. So I think that that gives us a sense of how these um, early results are going to play out over the long term, but really our future is still ahead of us. We're just starting. You know, this is an issue I feel very strongly about and passionately about. And, you know, a lot of people look at it from this perspective that you just uh, enunciated. The, you know, you, you look at the uh, aggregate of the results from space research and you ask the question, well, was it this really worth uh, all the investment? And I think you have to take a step back and look at it from a slightly different perspective. You know, science always stands on the shoulders of giants that came before. And, uh, you know, what you do is a stepwise building of knowledge. And what the space environment does is to offer a totally new perspective on how uh, biological systems, physical systems, chemical systems work. We cannot replicate microgravity on Earth. And so just to be able to go outside and outside of Earth's gravity and do those experiments, even if there are a few experiments, it gives us results that inspire enormous amount of research on the ground. So one experiment in space will result into a huge amount of ground research. And I'll give you a specific example. And that's the field of mechanobiology. So this whole field uh, that started in the 1990s of understanding what is the importance of mechanical stimulation in cell biology and tissue biology and organismal biology. That whole field flourished because of initial uh, support for a NASA investigator, Donald Ingber, that made some key discoveries on how those mechanical forces uh, were, uh, were, were being transmitted by cells. And so that is a, a field now that's inspired, that, that has thousands and thousands and thousands of publications and key results that are extremely important in medicine and cancer that was uh, started, the ideas that seeded that field came from that perspective that we got in microgravity. So even if by the numbers the science that is done in space it does not appear to be very productive, and that's not always true. It's actually, you know, given the few, the few opportunities that are available, the results are pretty good. 
but still it has a multiplicative effect. It's, it's a unique opportunity, something unseen anywhere else. So that, that inspires more research. And just for that, I think the value is immeasurable. I would also add to that <clears throat> something I think that's often overlooked. And just keep in mind that any time you think outside of the box, any time you push the frontiers and you challenge paradigms, you're met with skepticism in any field, but especially science. I mean, when, when computers were first invented, there was no thought of them having any use whatsoever for the general public. And all of us in this room can list about a hundred other discoveries the same way as well. You're often met with criticism and skepticism when you're challenging paradigms. And as every investigator at this table has just told you, you have a new paradigm, it's relatively untapped. You have a new platform to understand how cells are behaving differently, whether we're studying infectious disease, whether we're studying uh, stem cell uh, and, and, and tissue regeneration, whether we're understanding how plants develop normally, whether we're studying aging, whether we're studying muscle, waste, uh, muscle wasting diseases, bone loss. Does this sound familiar to everyone? Because these are the major problems we face here on Earth. But we're thinking in a new way about how to address these issues. And in some of these fields, we've kind of pushed conventional methods about as far as we can. Most certainly in infectious disease research, the pathogens are winning. Antibiotic resistance is on the increase. Antimicrobial therapies are not on the increase. Okay, they're smarter than we are. So we need to use new ways, new platforms, new methods to get them to unveil their secrets so we can better understand how they're functioning. And this is, it shouldn't really surprise anybody, we do this all the time. We put cells in extreme heat conditions. Oh, look at that response, I didn't know I could do that. Well, now I've just advanced forensics medicine and I've advanced uh, uh, cloning and DNA sequencing. Oh, well, let's put them in this very low pH. What can they do? My gosh, stress doesn't cause ulcers. A bacteria that can survive in a pH below one causes ulcers and stomach cancers. You see the pattern here. So it always kind of surprises me as a scientist is in terms of why some people seem to just want to shut the doors. Oh, no value. You just dismiss something as having no value without really looking at what's been done there. And true, as Dr. Robinson said, we have begun to touch the tip of using this platform. We haven't had a lot of time to do science up there. But that's why um, I think you're seeing a mounting interest. I know I have been seeing it from the commercial side, from the academia side. Okay, and from the government side about what, what kind of new secrets can this platform really unveil to us? What kind of potential, and it is significant, to really start to translationally advance those results from the bench, okay, in the lab, and now on the bench on the ISS, and bring it back down here on Earth to translationally advance our quality of life and human health. NASA's been doing this since day one. Okay, now is the opportunity, now is the time to move. You have the lab built, you have the structure up there. We gotta rock and roll and use it. Actually, more than anything, I'm just looking for data points, which I assume as scientists you appreciate. Uh, when you, I, I've been here forever, you know, for years hearing how this will do, you know, this is doing this, and I just am looking for some data to support this. If you go to NASA.gov, yeah. okay. NASA under ISS Research, you can click on Benefits. It will give you some of the top stories. You can also click on Publications and get a complete list of the publications that we know of from ISS Research to date, roughly 400 or so publications. Well, well I mean, the, that's the facts about the scientific publications. I would say the bulk of the work on ISS, because it takes three to five years for many publications to come out from spaceflight, the bulk of the publications are far ahead of us, even from the assembly work. Um, but you can read about the patents, you can read about the new products uh, that have been developed and are in the commercial marketplace based on ISS research. So, uh, and we can give you more information on that afterward as well. In the back here. Gene McCulka with Talking Space for uh, Dr. Alameda. Uh, your research deals in cell regeneration and so on. Right now, to get rid of a really troublesome wound, you have people spending hours and hours and hours in hyperbaric chambers to try to heal this. Would you, what you're doing sort of possibly negate that possibility for, of an individual who has a particularly troublesome wound that just can't heal uh, of spending like, hours in a, in a hyperbaric chamber, say? Yeah, well, um, the question of wound healing is, is particularly important from a medical point of view. Um, and 
the reason is that I, I talked about newts uh, earlier. Um, humans, like newts, have the regenerative ability. So if you, uh, but we lose it around birth. So if, if for instance, if, a, if a, a birth defect is discovered in utero, surgeons nowadays can go in and perform an in utero surgery, and wound healing occurs perfectly, regeneratively, you know, like as in a newt. When you cut a tail or a leg, it grows back and it's fully functional. The patterning of development occurs normally. So the newts are, are, are amazing. You can cut the spinal cord and they'll grow it back and they'll walk again. Uh, you can take out a third of the heart. Some of these experiments are quite barbaric, but they were done uh, over the years in the interest of science. And these animals have a full regenerative ability. Uh, if the animal survives, it will grow it back. It can, you can cut the lens, uh, the retina, all, it all grows back. Humans are like that too. We have exactly the same genes. And uh, a human being in utero can do the same tricks biologically. And so part of the results of this research that is ongoing is understanding this field. And the field of regenerative medicine is just exploding. Uh, and some of the work in regeneration is being done in space. The Russians in particular have done a long string of experiments with regeneration in space and how microgravity might affect that. So absolutely. So if we learn that the, now, the key difference, why, don't, why do we lose that ability? I think evolutionarily human beings switched from uh, regenerating to making a quick fix, uh, uh, a clot, uh, and then a, a, a provisional repair. And so that doesn't repattern development. So we need to learn how to turn off the genes that make that quick repair that allows us to survive even though our wound uh, is there. Uh, and we need to uh, learn to uh, regenerate the, the tissue that was damaged. And so what microgravity is doing is keeping those stem cells uh, from differentiating. So that might be a way of letting those cells grow enough so that the, the tissue can be regenerated uh, instead of, uh, of having a, a wound healing response. So there's a lot of insight that can be gained from doing the experiments in microgravity that can probably be used uh, in the field of regeneration and wound healing. But, you know, science is quite serendipitous. You know, sometimes, very often, we don't find the things that we set out to find in our grants. And it's somebody else that wanted to discover something totally unrelated that comes up with the breakthrough. So, you know, that, that uh, you know, the, the accounting mentality of uh, seeing, asking the question, you know, what did you get for, you know, did you reach your goal? Science doesn't quite work like that. You know, you have an aggregate of scientists doing research and, you know, it's very rare for the people that seek to fix a particular disease to actually fix that disease. Somebody else will do it by accident. Even the pharma companies nowadays, they are cutting down their research departments and instead, because they've figured out that trying to fix some disease in their own research department this just doesn't work, it's not productive. They will go and they'll buy out a specific company, startup company, that, that has bumped into the answer for, that, for their problem. And so, in general, that's how science goes. You know, you cannot expect, you know, a neat uh, follow-up from grant to result. You support research in general, and, you know, in, in general there's a good outcome, but it's not entirely predictable and it's not entirely entirely accountable for uh, using, you know, normal rules of accounting. Okay, we'll uh, wrap it up by taking one last question from Catherine. Yeah, Catherine Qualtro um, with Kiwi Space Foundation. Um, this is for Dr. Robinson. Um, as a physicist, I'm kind of interested in the, in the alpha magnetic spectrometer. Is there any indication on when we can expect, I know there's a deluge of data, obviously, when we can expect um, a major publication of, of the data? certainly is a deluge of data and there's also a deluge of investigators involved in the alpha magnetic spectrometer roughly 500 investigators from around the world so it will take them some time to analyze their data and I'm suspecting that that they're going to be capturing you know one of the things that they're doing in that experiment is really looking for spe specific signs of antimatter 
matter antimatter flux and also looking for certain signs of specific kinds of particles called neutralinos that help validate theories of subatomic particles. I'm suspecting that when they start getting that data, they're going to take a little bit of time to be absolutely sure they've got it right. And the first thing you'll hear about that is when it's published in a major scientific journal. Given the, the caliber of the scientists, the no Nobel laureate Sam Ting, and, and then the other 500 team members, I'm expecting that's how it's going to roll out. All right, uh, that's all the time we have for questions. We'll close with some closing comments from Dr. Robinson. So uh, today you heard a lot about some biotechnology applications that are really relevant for life here on Earth as well, and especially for improving human health on Earth. I just want to emphasize that you're, you're seeing three of a hundred U.S. investigators that we could have brought to you today. The amount of throughput going through the laboratory on the space station now that we're in our full research and technology development phase is amazing, and we're just beginning the first of at least 10 years of this kind of research. So I want to share with you that enthusiasm that we have on the road forward forward ahead of us. And in a very different type of flavor, we do have technology tests going on on the International Space Station, tests of human physiology, uh, tests of physics, fundamental physical processes, fluid physics. Uh, we have instruments to observe the Earth going up. We have instruments to observe the cosmos, such as the alpha magnetic spectrometer. It's an extraordinary diversity. There's never been a laboratory with this kind of diversity of scientific use. So go to nasa.gov. You can read information about all of the experiments going on right now and everything that's happened in the past. And uh, on NASA TV at 2.30 Eastern Time today, and also for those of you in the room here locally at KSC, you'll have the opportunity to have a demonstration of the robotic refueling mission hardware and see how that hardware will be testing our ability to refuel uh, future spacecraft in space. Thank all you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, we also want to invite you to check out the NASA website to keep up on the uh, status of the countdown for shuttle mission STS-135. Just go to www.nasa.gov shuttle. Thank you all very much.